A very good evening aspirants. We have a very proud moment to share with you. Shankar IAS Academy every year provides free coaching to 25 differently abled candidates. And this is provided under the Shankar Memorial Trust. And we are happy to announce that one of the candidates who received free coaching under this scheme has secured a rank in the Civil Services Examination 2020. The candidate's name is D. Ranjit. He is a differently abled candidate with hearing disability. He has secured 750th rank in the UPSC Civil Services Examination 2020. And we also apologize for announcing that this candidate received free coaching under the scheme provided by Ministry of Social Justice and Empowerment. In addition to this, we are also extremely happy to announce that more than 360 students have cleared UPSC Civil Services examination from Shankarai Academy. So with this information, let us move on to today's Hindi News Analysis for the date 4th of October 2020. As you can see here, this is the list of news articles today. Today we have five news articles for discussion. There is one editorial also. And in this first discussion, we are going to see about important Chola inscriptions. And we are going to discuss about uh, some of the important terms that are mentioned in these inscriptions. These are very important from the prelims perspective. Now this next topic is based on shadow plantations. In this discussion, we are also going to discuss about the benefits of shadow plantation. And in this fourth discussion, we are going to discuss about an important terminology regarding airspace. And in this fifth discussion, we are going to discuss about the gaming disorders and the guidelines given by WHO regarding gaming disorder. Along with this, we have two practice questions for today and I also have a one quiz question as usual. So listen to the discussion carefully so that you can attend the quiz easily. With this, let us move on to first discussion for today. Now this news article talks about Chola inscriptions in a place called Tenneri village. This village is situated in Kanchipuram district of Tamil Nadu. So in the recent times we are hearing many sites related to Chola empire. So remember all these places, it is very important from prelims perspective. Now this inscription that is found at the Teneri village, it throws light on local administration during those times. In addition to Teneri village inscriptions, another set of Chola inscription is very important. These inscriptions are called as the Uttiramerur inscriptions. So today we are going to have a brief understanding about these inscriptions, what these inscriptions say and you will also see the important terms mentioned in these inscriptions. So you may think why we are discussing about inscriptions and the terms mentioned in it. In the last few years, if you see the prelims question paper, UPSC has started asking various terms related to ancient history. For example, if you see this question which appeared in 2020, in this question the terms Kulavapa, Dronavapa was asked. Now if you take this 2019 question, it is about a sculpture inscription. And if you take this 2016 question, you have a pair based question where on one side different terminologies from history are given. And these terms have been given along with a certain description. We have to say whether the description is right or not. So we can see that in the past years, UPSC has been framing questions based on inscriptions and also based on the terminologies in the ancient history. And that is why today we are going to discuss about the Uttiramerur inscription and Tenere inscription. And we'll also see some of the important terminologies mentioned in these inscription. So first, let us talk about the Uttiramerur inscription. See, this inscription is found in the Uttiramerur Taluk. This is also situated in Kanchipuram district only. It is said that the Uttiramerur inscriptions are the inscriptions which are found in two temples in that area. These two temples are the Vaikuntha Permal Temple and the Sundara Varada Permal Temple. And these temples are said to have many inscriptions based on Cholas and even Vijayanagar Empire also. So today the Uttiramerur inscription which we are talking about is a classic inscription. And this inscription, which is found in these two temples, it is said to be from the times of Parantaka Chola. He was a king at that time. Uh, it was around 920 CE. 
and the inscriptions from these temples refer to election procedure and they also mention about the qualifications of members of the committees see the inscriptions describes in detail about the code of conduct for holding local body elections and it could also be learned from the inscription that for the ease of administration the settlement area was split into 30 wards and these wards were governed by local village assembly and the assembly in turn was constituted into committees for monitoring the water bodies agricultural land gold trade etc so later in the discussion we'll discuss about these committees and the names of these committees and it is said that the vaikunta permal temple served as a assembly hall of these committees so the crux of the documentation in uttara meru is that it has elaborate definition of the eligibility of contestants who are contesting in the elections that is the local body elections and it also has description regarding the selection process and that is why uttara meru inscription is quite unique and special in the ancient history it is also said as rebirth of modern day democracy See at that time the election process was quite progressive this could be found from the inscriptions it was progressive to the extent that at that time itself the process was in lines with the current democracy terms and rules for example if you take the election process it also involved disqualification of people it laid down grounds for disqualification of people for example persons from previous tenure who had not submitted their accounts they were disqualified then those who had accepted bribe or those who were known for misappropriation of property they were disqualified and then those who had worked against the interests of the village and those who caused hindrance to public life they were also disqualified and more interestingly even the immediate relatives of a disqualified person were not allowed to contest in the village assembly election so we can see the progressive rules that existed at that time and these are mentioned in the uttara meru inscriptions now well, let us move to the next set of inscriptions which is found at the tenneri village it is also called as the tenneri inscription now the inscriptions at this place shed light on how farm produce was taxed at that time along with this it also laid down qualifications for candidates to become members of village administrative committees For example the qualifications included like the candidates should own land then they should not have any case pending against them then they should be highly educated then there was also condition that the candidates should have maintained his accounts in a transparent manner now if we talk about the taxing of farm produce it could be found that different types and procedures of taxes were present at that time for example if you take areca nuts only 50% tax was collected for the first 10 years after cultivation full tax was collected only after the tree started yielding fruits so these are some of the important points mentioned in the uttara meru inscriptions and tenneri inscriptions now let us see some of the important terms that are related to the points which we just saw we saw it in english now we'll see the exact terminologies that is mentioned defining the election process the committees etc for example the first term is the kuda vole In Tamil, kudam means pot, ole means dried leaf. So this kudam ole talked about the election system at that time, which talked about the pot system. Nowadays we have the ballot system like that. At that time there existed a pot system, and this kudam ole system was especially followed for electing members to annual committees, garden committee, tank committee, and other committees. We'll see the names of this committee in the next term. Just remember that this term kudam ole. was found in the inscriptions of uttara meru now the next term is variams now variam in tamil literally means committees so at that time there were many variams to aid in administration that is there were many committees to aid in administration you can imagine it like you know how we have ministries nowadays we have ministries at the state level at the central level so at that time they had variams or committees so these ministry kinds were constituted at local level in those times for administration and according to the inscriptions male members of the society were the members of these variams now if you take the composition of these variams and the qualification and duration of membership all of these differed from village to village but as we already said there are many committees that is there were many variams in every village for example they had the nyaya variam this administered justice then they had the tota variam this committee looked after flower gardens and then they had the dharma variam this committee looked after charities and temples and then they had eri variam this was in charge of tanks and water supply 
and then they had the ponvaryam this committee was in charge of finance and then they had the grama karyavaryam now this committee looked after the works of all committees so they had nyayavaryam totavaryam dharmavaryam erivaryam ponvaryam grama karyavaryam and the members belonging to these varyams were known as varya permakkal so remember that the term varya permakkal denotes the members of the different committees that existed in every village at that time now these varyams were important because their good functioning increased the efficiency of the local administration of the cholas and remember these varyams is said to be mentioned in the uttara merur inscriptions now from the tenner inscription we have an important term called as perumkuri sabai this term denotes the village administrative committees which we saw during discussion so this is also related to a type of committee only so that is all in this discussion we saw about two types of inscriptions one is uttara merur inscription and the tenner inscription and these inscriptions were about the cholas and their election procedure their qualifications of members of committees etc that is it talked about the local administration of cholas then we saw about the terms or conditions of disqualification then we also saw about some important terminologies mentioned in these inscriptions such as we saw about kudavolai kudavolai means the system that was followed to elect the members to different committees then we saw about the varyams varyams are nothing but the committees that existed at that time at the village level and we saw different committees especially we saw that varya permakkal were the people who were members of these committees and then finally we also saw about perumkuri sabai these are nothing but the village administrative committees so with this information in mind now let us move on to the next discussion our next discussion is based on this news article which appeared in bengaluru edition of hindi newspaper this news article talks about a recent study that was conducted in the coffee plantations in the western ghats the aim of this study was to understand the response of resident birds to different kinds of plantations such as uh, shade coffee plantation and the open coffee plantations and according to the findings of this study the richness and the abundance of species of birds were found to be higher in the shade coffee plantations compared to the open coffee plantations so this is the gist of this news article and our focus here should be on the shade plantation and we are going to understand shade plantation with the help of coffee cultivation see as we just saw there are two main methods of coffee cultivation one is the sun grown coffee and the other is the shade grown coffee now this shade grown coffee is cultivated using the shade planting which is also called as shadow planting and this is the traditional approach of coffee plantation in this method the coffee trees are planted together with other types of shade trees that is in these types of plantations coffee plants are grown under a canopy of shade trees so here what are these shade trees these are the large trees whose primary role is to provide protection to the surrounding plants using its large canopy and crown and this form of cultivation is the exact opposite of the sun grown coffee cultivation which is an open coffee plantation so just for understanding know that some popular types of shade trees include the goni basri mithli and atti these are preferred since they have large spreading branches and they also deposit large quantities of leaf litter in the soil also the jack trees are found very common in the plantations in south india but the problem with these jack plantations is that the jack fruits attract cattle and monkey so these jack fruits should be removed before they mature otherwise the plantation will be threatened by cattle and monkeys now such kind of shadow plantations have many benefits let us see them one by one now first is the richness and abundance of species such as bird species so usually most birds prefer bigger trees to build their nests and this is the reason why more birds are spotted in shadow plantations compared to open plantations according to the study now this high diversity of species allows the formation of a complex food networks see here you should understand that these birds play an important role in pest control and these birds eat many herbivorous insects such as the coffee borer these coffee borer insects are harmful to the coffee plantations so to protect from coffee borer insects farmers usually use 
pesticides and for that they have to invest a particular amount of money for buying pesticides but since the coffee plantations are grown using the shadow plantation it will have more birds and these birds act as pest control agents so this in turn reduces the farmers cost of investment in pesticides so this is the first benefit of shadow plantation now the second benefit is that such tree diversity also increases the population of pollinating insects like bees and these bees as we know they further increase the production of coffee cherries through the process of pollination and most importantly the health of soil is also impacted positively when shadow cultivation is used See what happens is when other trees are grown along with coffee plantation it actually replenishes the soil by drawing up nutrients from deep in the earth because the large trees have deep roots in addition to this when the leaves fall from these big trees they mix with the top soil and decompose now this in turn returns back the nutrients into the earth and this works as a manure for coffee plantation Thirdly it helps in maintaining the nutrient rich content of top soil and it helps the landscape in avoiding erosion so we know that coffee is often grown on sloping land and mountain sides and generally on these landscapes the nutrient rich top soil will be easily washed away by rain but this can be prevented with shadow plantation because the canopy cover from the shade trees offers more protection to the top soil from the rain and even from wind as you can see in this image as you can see here these tree canopies act as wind breakers now how they help in controlling erosion see the great number of root systems present in these large trees binds the soil together and therefore it decreases the erosion in these plantations apart from this another benefit is that shadow plantation helps in increasing the longevity of coffee plant Generally see what happens is these plantations generally require less water when they are cultivated using shadow plantation because there is less transpiration transpiration means sweating in plants in transpiration what happens is there is movement of water throughout the plant and it reaches the leaves see the water moves from the soil into the plant roots and then from there it moves to the leaves now when it moves to the leaves the water is warmed by the sun and then it is turned into water vapor which in turn evaporates now this transpiration is important because it helps in cooling the plant and it also helps in pumping water and minerals to the leaves for photosynthesis so even though transpiration is an evaporative cooling system that brings down the temperature of plants still it leads to water loss and that is why transpiration needs to be accurately regulated but in shadow plantations this transpiration is quite less and that is why the plants require less water because the water is retained in the plant itself so requiring less water means the shadow grown plantations are more eco friendly in nature so these are some of the important benefits of shadow plantations or shade plantation in this discussion we saw what is shade plantation then we saw the benefits such as it helps in maintaining the biodiversity of the region it helps in pest control it reduces costs to the farmers then it helps in replenishing the soil then it helps in maintaining the nutrient rich top soil and it helps in controlling the soil erosion and finally it helps in less transpiration which in turn leads to less requirement of water for the plantation so these are the points that you need to remember regarding shadow plantation Now let us move to the next discussion. Our next discussion is based on this editorial, which focuses on the global food systems. So we know that there is an increasing spread in global hunger, and this scenario was particularly worsened in the COVID-19 pandemic. So to address this issue of hunger, an historic summit was held in the month of September this year. This summit is the United Nations Food Systems Summit, and it was mainly held to address this rising hunger and the editorial has been written in this background only so in this discussion we'll have a brief discussion about the summit we'll understand what do we mean by food systems and we'll see what is the position of india and the comments of authors in this regard the syllabus relevant to this discussion is given here for your reference so now let us move on to the discussion first let us see about the recently held united nations food systems summit 
Note that the main objective of the summit was to transform the way in which the world produces, consumes and thinks about food, which is nothing but the food systems. We'll see the definition of food systems later. First, let us see what happened in this summit. See, this summit created a debating mechanism and the aim of this mechanism was to come up with various themes and ideas for reimagining food systems. I note that the debate mainly focused on five action tracks. As you can see here, they are the actions to ensure access to safe and nutritious food for all, then to boost nature positive production, etc, etc. And remember, India was also a part of this summit. Even uh, India held the national dialogue on this summit. Now, according to this summit, at present, the global food systems in many countries are found to be in a state of crisis. It was already in crisis, which has been further aggravated by the pandemic. So first, what is this food system? So this term refers to a group of activities which are involved in producing, processing, transporting and consuming food. So it refers to the networks which are necessary for the production and transformation of food. Or we can say it includes the networks that ensure that food reaches the consumers. So this food system is directly connected to most social aspects and also much of the economic aspects of human existence. So when a food system functions well, they have the power to bring out efforts together for overall sustainability. But the problem is that many of the world's food systems are fragile, they are unexamined and they are vulnerable to collapse. This was particularly evident during the COVID-19 crisis because millions of people around the globe had to experience disruptions in food system supply chains. You should remember that failure of food systems is not at all manageable because their failure results in disorder and this disorder threatens our education, our health and economy and it also threatens the human rights, peace and security. Why? Because it overall leads to rising hunger. So when there is a failure of food system, there is rising hunger. Particularly those who are already poor or marginalized are the most vulnerable in such scenarios. Therefore, the scientists are believing that the transformations of global food system will help in addressing the issues, especially it will address the rising hunger. So why there is a need to eliminate world hunger? See, now we are going to see certain points. This will help you in your main answer writing as to substantiate your point of why eliminating world hunger is important. But what is the need for to do that? First and foremost, remember that food systems that eradicating hunger are important for achieving the Sustainable Development Agenda 2030. Especially as the authors of the editorial mention, around 11 out of 17 Sustainable Development Goals are found to be directly related to the food system. And secondly, if you take the State of Food Security and Nutrition in the World report, according to this report, around one-tenth of global population were estimated to be undernourished in the previous year. And thirdly, hunger and food security are key drivers of conflict and instability across the world. And that is why there is an immediate need to address it. And you can also mention that even the Nobel Peace Prize 2020 was conferred on the United Nations World Food Program. And this highlighted the importance of addressing hunger for preventing conflicts and creating stability. So these are some of the reasons why eradicating hunger is taken up an issue in the international arena. So overall, we can say that a proper functioning food system is important to eradicate hunger. But according to the authors, there are certain challenges faced by the food systems. The first and foremost challenge is the climate change this is accompanied by the unsustainable use of land and water resources. We know that climate change is affecting the rainfall pattern, which in turn affects the efficiency of agriculture in producing needed food grains. And secondly, dietary diversity, nutrition and related health outcomes is also a major concern because there is no dietary diversity and because of that, nutrition is getting affected. So you should understand that there is already increased focus on rice and wheat, we can also see the scenario in our country and there is only a minimal focus on nutri cereals and superfoods and this has led to nutritional challenges now the third challenge is the food waste or loss of food there is increased food waste so the need of the hour is to reduce food waste addressing this issue is quite important because this is directly linked to the efficiency of food supply chain so for an efficient food system these problems needs to be addressed first and for that authors ask the world to take lessons from India 
while reimagining the food systems we saw that scientists want to transform the food systems across the globe and for this authors are asking the world to take lessons from india but why india it is because of india's food safety nets see when we say food safety nets it refers to the subset of social safety net and these food safety nets aim to assure a minimum amount of food consumption and they also protect the households against shocks regarding food consumption so we can say that these food safety nets seek to assure a minimum level of well-being a minimum level of nutrition and it helps the households to manage risks regarding food so now what safety nets india has we'll see these safety nets with regard to the challenges for example if you take the nutritional challenge to address this challenge india fortifies its rice with iron this process of fortifying rice with iron is called as fortification and fortification means deliberately increasing the content of essential micronutrients in a food now this fortification is done to improve the nutritional quantity of food and to provide public health benefit with minimal risk to health and we know that in our country this fortified rice is supplied through the public distribution system along with this the research in our country is also focused on long term solution to undernutrition and malnutrition and according to the authors the agricultural research institutes are going to release crop varieties with much higher nutrition apart from all these the challenges in food systems could be addressed by equity in food and this is already achieved by india through its national food security act 2013 See this act is the foundation for other schemes of government such as the targeted public distribution system then the mid day meal scheme then the integrated child development services etc this act provides foundation for all these policies and schemes of government regarding food security and through these initiatives the indian food safety nets are linked with the public procurement and buffer stock policy along with inclusion that is they combine the indian food safety nets inclusion public procurement and buffer stock this was clearly seen during the measures taken by indian government in the pandemic if you remember the food crisis among the vulnerable and marginalized families in india was minimized through the supply of food grains through the targeted public distribution system and buffer stock of food grains So to an extent India was able to address the food crisis and this is the reason why authors want the world to learn from India and we have to remember that the Indian food system is based on small and medium scale production so keeping all these facts in mind the authors conclude that it is the right time for both India and other nations to collaborate for investments innovation and also for creating lasting solutions in sustainable agriculture because just now we saw that india is a major contributor to equitable livelihood food security and nutrition and such a collaboration will help the world nations in advancing their equitable livelihood or a livelihood in which the food systems transformation is anchored around small and medium scale production which involves family farmers indigenous people women and workers in the food value chains so these are some of the take away points from this editorial article in this editorial article authors discussed about the status of global food systems so we discussed about the united nations food system summit we saw what do you mean by food systems and then we saw what are these food safety nets of india and why the world should learn from india now let us move to the next discussion our next discussion is based on this news article from the world page of hindu newspaper it mentions that On Saturday as many as 39 aircrafts have entered the air defense identification zone of Taiwan and they have entered from China. If you remember we already saw the issue between Taiwan and China on 28th September discussion. You can view that analysis to know about the issue. So the crux of this recent move of China is that it is in an effort to assert supremacy over Taiwan and therefore it has sent these aircrafts to intrude into Taiwan. but today we are going to focus on this air defense identification zone from preliminary perspective so what is this zone see it is a zone which provides an early warning system to help a country so that they can detect possible incursions into their sovereign airspace let us understand it simply assume that there is an aircraft which is entering our air defense identification zone and this aircraft is entering without warning or permission So in this scenario we may alert and mobilize our fighter jets 
so that they can visually identify the aircraft and these fighter jets can determine whether the aircraft which has entered the ADIZ poses a threat or not. So this ADIZ is an airspace which is over land or water and in this airspace the identification, location and control of civil aircraft are performed in the interest of national security. Just know that the first ADIZ was established by United States in 1950s itself. And since then, many countries have ADIZs, including India. But note that this concept of ADIZ is not defined in any international treaty and it is also not regulated by any international body. So the rules associated with ADIZ is country specific and it depends on that particular country. So now what about Air Defense Identification Zone in India? So India established its ADIZs in the mid 20th century. So for any aircraft to enter the Indian airspace, notifications are required 10 minutes prior to entry. And India has demarcated many ADIZs near its territory. And some of the important ADIZs are the ones that are along the international borders with Pakistan, Nepal, Bangladesh, Bhutan and Myanmar. And we also have ADIZ over the line of actual control with China. And then there are two ADIZ in the southern region of India. But who is responsible for enforcement of this ADIZ? See, in our country, the military enforcement of ADIZs is the sole responsibility of Indian Air Force. And here the task is executed by Indian Air Force through a chain of radars. We can thank the technology here. And apart from Indian Air Force, the civil aviation authorities also work in conjunction with IAF to assist in this process. And they ensure that regulatory and control measures are put in place for security reasons. So ADIZ is the airspace over land or ocean where the country involved detects the possible incursions into its sovereign airspace. And today's news is that around 39 aircrafts have entered the ADIZ of Taiwan from China. So we have to wait and see what happens and what is the development regarding the issue between Taiwan and China. So we're going to see many news articles regarding this issue in the coming days. But today we are going to finish with this discussion on ADIZ. Now let us move on to the next discussion. Our next discussion is going to be based on this news article which is titled as Gaming Disorder Increases During Pandemic. So the article talks about the increasing instances of gaming disorder. So in this discussion we are going to discuss about this disorder and some of the measures taken to address this disorder. See this is a new disorder which is a result of digital technology and its misuse. And this discussion will help you in your essay paper. If there is a question regarding the ill effects of digital technology, you can talk about this disorder. So first, what is this disorder? According to WHO, it is a pattern of video gaming behavior which is characterized by impaired control over gaming and increased priority is given to gaming over other activities. So all this happens to the extent that gaming takes precedence over other interests and other daily activities. That means the gamers continue to play despite the occurrence of negative consequences. They continue to play without indulging in their daily activities. But remember that for gaming disorder to be diagnosed, the behavior pattern must be of sufficient severity. The symptoms should be evident for at least 12 months. And then only it qualifies to be a disorder. And here you should also note that in 2018, WHO has included gaming disorder as a mental health issue. So to address it, WHO has also given out basic guidelines to the people who partake in gaming. And two of the important points from these guidelines are that, first one, the gamers should be alert to the amount of time they spend on gaming activities. That is, they should know how much time they are spending on the gaming activities, especially when they are not doing any other daily activities or when they are avoiding other daily activities for gaming. So if they keep track of this timing, they will be able to control it. Secondly, the gamers should also be aware to any changes in their physical or psychological health and social functioning that could be attributed to their pattern of gaming behavior. If these guidelines are followed, then we will know when the behavior is turning into a disorder or they can take measures to prevent it from becoming a disorder. And one of the measures that is suggested to address this is digital fasting, which is nothing but the suggestion in this digital age to keep away from gadgets. There was also a challenge that was organized recently in this regard. It was a 50-day digital fasting challenge organized by Jane Foundation Doughton. 
this challenge involved spending 12 hours a day without the use of digital technologies so remember it not only involved gaming but other digital technologies also so this challenge was intended to shatter the virtual bondage and it aimed at strengthening the bonds within families in addition to this we also have the shut clinic in india this is where the gaming disorder is treated in our country here the shut is expanded as service for healthy use of technology so this is a facility that exclusively deals with the intersection between technology and psychological wellness so we can assume from its name that it will rehabilitate those who are having gaming disorder in a way that they can healthily use the technologies this clinic is located at uh, nimhan center in bengaluru just know that shut clinic also has an app to bring about behavior regulation among the gamers so if you know anyone who is spending a lot of amount in gaming then you can ask them to download this app so that they can regulate their behavior so these are some of the points that you can take note from this discussion on gaming disorder so with this discussion we are moving to the next session which is the practice questions discussion so let us see the first question this is a pair based question on one side terms are given and on the other side meaning of these terms are given and we have to choose the correctly matched pair first pair is variums committees during discussion we saw that the committees are called as variums in the uttaramerur inscriptions second term perumkuri sabai village administrative committees this pair is also a correct pair this term is mentioned in the tenneri inscriptions and the third pair kudavolai tax collection system this is an incorrect pair because during discussion we did not see any term related to tax collection system we just saw that agricultural produce were taxed differently at that time and it was found in the inscriptions in tenneri and here the term kudavolai means pot ticket system it is an electoral system in which the members of different committees are elected this is a system which is similar to the ballot system so this is an incorrect pair if you remove 3 from the given options you have two options left option a and c and the correct answer is option c one and two only because both these pairs are correct now this next question is with reference to air defense identification zones first statement is it is an airspace over land or water in which the identification location and control of civil aircraft are performed in the interest of national security so in this statement you may have doubt regarding over land or water part this is correct only and this is the exact definition of adiz now the second statement india is yet to establish an adiz this statement is incorrect during discussion we saw that india already established adiz and we have many adizs over international borders over the lac etc now the third statement concept of an adiz is not defined in any international treaty as of now it is not defined in any international treaty so this statement is actually correct and here the question asks for the correct statements only so the correct answer to this question is option b 1 and 3 only so with these two prelims practice questions discussion let us take the quiz for today this quiz has been framed on the shadow plantation discussion and you have to identify which of these are the benefits of shadow plantation try to read each given options carefully and then mention the correct answer in the comment section as usual and I will tell you whether your answer is right or not and if possible try to mention why your answer is correct so now let us take up this mains practice question this has been framed based on our editorial discussion so interested aspirants can write answer to this question and post it in the comment section for peer review so aspirants and viewers with this discussion now we have come to the end of today's Hindi news analysis if you like this video don't forget to like comment and share and do subscribe to Shankar IAS Academy YouTube channel for more updates related to civil services preparation thank you